Thank you, everybody, for coming. Welcome. Welcome to the Ask EFF panel. We're so glad to see so many of you people here today. Uh, this is going to be uh, kind of a lightning round. We have about uh, 30 minutes in here, and with a transition, that means about 20 minutes for questions. Uh, so we're going to do very brief introductions, and then we'll look forward to answering your questions. Uh, a brief uh, a word of warning. Uh, as many of you know, one of the things we do here is we provide uh, some legal advice to people who are in need from this community. This is not the place for those questions. You want to have that in private conversations with the uh, privilege attaching. These are the place for more of your general questions about some of our work and policy initiatives. Um, and so while you're thinking of the great uh, questions to ask, I'll begin with the introductions. My name is Kurt Opsahl. I'm the general counsel at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. EFF, as you probably all know because you're here, uh, we are a nonprofit civil liberties organization dedicated to defending your rights online. Uh, and with that, I will let our esteemed collection of panelists introduce themselves. My name is Jeremy Glula. I'm on the tech projects team at EFF, so we're the team that develops things like CertBot and Let's Encrypt and HTTPS Everywhere and Privacy Badger and also explain tech to the lawyer people. Hi, my name is Katitza Rodriguez. I'm EFF International Rights Director. I work on global surveillance issues, helping groups fight draconian surveillance laws, and in particular in Latin America. Hi, I'm Andrew Crocker. I'm a staff attorney. I work on our civil liberties team, especially on our national security, privacy, crypto stuff. Hi, I'm Eva Galperin. I work on EFF's international team, mostly on issues regarding privacy and security of vulnerable populations all over the world. I also do our state-sponsored malware research. And I'm Nate Cardozo. I'm a senior staff attorney at EFF. Uh, I do crypto and security policy as well as free speech and privacy litigation. And I will be giving a talk immediately after this one in this same room about crypto law. Ooh. So yeah, save, save your crypto law questions for that talk because it's going to be great. Uh, so we have a mic here in the center aisle. So if you uh, have a question, why don't you come on forward and, and ask on the mic. Hi. Um, my question is, do you think we can trust Tom Wheeler? Sir. Tom Wheeler? Oh. Um, Go for it. Take that one. Uh, so I'm probably the only person on this panel who's worked on net neutrality issues. So, uh, I, I mean, in some sense, we don't have to trust him, right? Because everything that he would do that would have any consequence ends up being a public thing. Uh, but it, I have been very pleasantly surprised by the direction he's been pushing the FCC. So, I mean, I trust him, but I also keep an eye on it. So trust but verify? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, so what do you think the privacy and security implications are for Americans following the IANA transition? Hmm. Anyone? The person, the person who worked on ICANN is not here, so yeah. Ask Danny. And none no. of the rest of you does anything it's with Jeremy Malcolm. Oh, sure. ask Jeremy Malcolm. Malcolm. Yeah, we have at this point about uh, 70 employees, and uh, we bring a, a good selection here. This is a great group of folks, but unfortunately, we can't cover every possible uh, possible issue. And also, ICANN staff and the Yana transition is not a topic we give priority in EFF. All right. Anyone else uh, have a question? To come forward. So we can also uh, give a little brief discussion of some of the things that that we have been uh, working on while you're getting your uh, your questions ready. Uh, well, let's, uh, please. Hi, I just got asked by a friend if the EFF would endorse his campaign for judge, and I said I was sort of dubious about that. Can you elucidate whether EFF can or cannot participate in political endorsements of candidates or positions, and why or why not? Uh, well, we actually uh, cannot. Uh, as a nonprofit organization, uh, we don't uh, get involved in what's known as electioneering. Uh, this means on the plus side, if you donate to EFF, it is a tax-deductible donation, and we get some uh, advantages as an organization. But uh, that, that also comes that we are a nonpartisan, nonpolitical organization that doesn't uh, get involved in elections. All right, Who well, wants to talk about export controls? I see you trolling. One, thank you for your guys' help with the net neutrality stuff. I think everybody in here greatly appreciates it, so thank you. Um, is anybody on the panel? Not just me, but a lot of other people. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, actually, I'm curious, is anybody here familiar with the kind of stuff that's going on in Europe right now with the Privacy Shield and GDPR? That's Danny. Um, I don't know the, uh, the content of the GDPR right now. I know that um, European Union have passed a new regulation for Data Protection Directive and it's the GDPR. Um, but, uh, due to uh, Max Scherm's uh, litigation, um, the safe harbor provision, which allows it's a European provision that compels companies to, if you want to transfer data from the European Union to the United States, yeah. you have to, or to any country, have to be an adequate country. So, um, okay. so the question, I, I, and you may not know the answer, which is fine, but I was just curious, like, I've been looking at it uh, pretty heavily, and I don't think America is ready. <laughs> and I w it, it, the, uh, the, ex the like, right to be forgotten clauses, even from a technology perspective, there's just a lot in there that I think is going to be extremely disruptive, and I just didn't know if you had a take on that or not. I got it. Yeah, um, okay, yeah, I also got it. But oh, the right to be forgotten. <laughs> um, if you want to see people from EFF really squirm uncomfortably, ask us about the place where your right to privacy and your right to free speech overlap. Um, in Europe, uh, the right to be forgotten is actually quite reasonably popular. Uh, in the United States, we tend to sort of err on the side of the First Amendment, and uh, EFF believes that the right to be forgotten is actually quite problematic. On one hand, who among us has not done things that have ended up on the internet that we're not terribly proud of that we would like to see not indexed by Google? Uh, on the other hand, what we're really worried about is that the right to be forgotten can and will be used by the powerful to cover up their misdeeds. And in fact, we have a great deal of evidence that this is exactly what is happening. So uh, EFF does not support the right to be forgotten. We think it's super extra problematic. Uh, but that is just one provision of the GDPR. And I want to put an example. In Latin America, we copy a lot of uh, laws from Europe, um, from data retention to the right to be forgotten. So we already have bad precedents, in, for instance, right now in Peru, that they um, a right to be forgotten case when they put a, a huge fine to Google, but also to another, another case that they put a huge, they are investigating uh, investigative journalists. So we have problems in Mexico and in Colombia. In, the sentence in Colombia was favorable to, to Google, but it was not good for the media. The media have to take down the content, uh, the, the index, the content from their website. Yeah. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, is there anything that the EFF is doing or can do to uh, move technologies that are ITAR restricted and uh, dual use that are out there and uh, essentially that is there a way to move them from ITAR to dual use or off of that? Um, sure, thank you for biting on my export control taunt. Um, <laughs> we, we do a lot of work around export controls. Uh, most recently, uh, the State Department proposed listing cyber products on ITAR um, without defining what that is or what it means or what it would be. Uh, so we wrote, uh, we, we only caught wind of it a couple of days before it was debated. Uh, and we, along with our friends at Access Now, uh, wrote a uh, very strongly worded letter saying, don't do this, this is stupid. Um, we are also working to make sure uh, that things like pen testing tools don't get included in the EAR. Um, right now, crypto is still unfortunately in the EAR. It's What's not an EAR? ITAR. What? What's an EAR? Oh, EAR is the Export Administration Regulations. It's administered by the Commerce Department. Uh, and it covers dual-use technologies. Uh, it's a lot better than ITAR, which is the United States munitions list. Uh, crypto used to be treated the same way as tanks and hand grenades. Now it's treated the same way as MRI machines. Um, so we're, we're, making, we're, we're trying to make sure that things like pen testing tools don't require a license to export. Um, so stay tuned, that's the Vosnar arrangement uh, process. Uh, I was on a panel last year in this hall talking about that, uh, and it's still very much live. So we, we blog about it from time to time. Eva and I uh, are leads on ITAR and EAR stuff at EFF. Hi. Hello. I always leave DEF CON feeling a bit deflated, so I wondered if there's some good things that happened in the last year or some good trends that maybe you could highlight, hopefully. What's the, what's the good news? Well, we won the Apple yeah, FBI case. Yeah. 
<laughs> so um, I, last year, uh, oh, sorry. Do you want to talk about Let's Encrypt say for second yeah. years? Yeah. Oh, yeah, the launch of Let's Encrypt uh, in the past so year. Oh, did I steal? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to steal it. Yeah. Free certificates, easy to set up. I'd say that's a pretty big win. Well, I have uh, pretty with wings in small countries too. We defeat data retention in Paraguay, which is a big issue because the European Union have been defeating, uh, exporting these laws to developing countries. And that but was the first win in that country. Another big win is uh, the increasing use of end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, as you probably know, EFF has a lot of interesting projects to encrypt the web, uh, encrypting data in transit. So we have HTTPS everywhere. We started surf, the CertBot. Um, but this year, uh, we saw the implementation of the Signal protocol uh, for end-to-end -end encryption in all WhatsApp messages. And WhatsApp is the largest uh, sort of uh, messaging uh, platform in the world. So that brings end-to-end -end encryption by default to hundreds of millions of people. And I think that's kind of... 1.1 billion people, $1 billion. Um, so I think that's a pretty big deal, it's a big win. Right, so, was it, so last year, uh, Let's Encrypt was just in beta, and uh, this year, it's, you know, it's everywhere. I mean, in the developer community at least, and I'm using it in production now. And uh, it's, I, I'm, I was sick of paying for certificates every year and everything, so thank you for that. Um, what's, what are the next steps for Let's Encrypt? And how do we get it kind of everywhere and make that the default for everyone from the WordPress guy all the way to the backend server admin? So uh, one thing that uh, I think it either just happened or it's about to happen is that the Let's Encrypt root certificate is going into the Mozilla Trust Store, which is pretty awesome. Um, and then, uh, let's see, we're working on uh, new uh, challenge techniques uh, or new challenge protocols, um, and we're just gonna keep pushing it out. Um, I mean, it, at some level, it's just, just it get, it'll just keep being adopted, people keep using it. Um, Are we the second or third biggest CA in the world? It, I, I think third, but I also think it depends on how you measure. Uh, so, right. yeah, I mean, just keep telling everyone to use it, is basically it. Hi guys. So I have two questions. You probably know that the EFF is a big player nowadays and a lot of people use your, you know, extensions and let's encrypt. So the first question is, can the EFF be in any way forced to cooperate with your favorite three letter agencies? The first question. And the second is, if that happens, what kind of safeguards and ways you have to notify users that this is happening? Some kind of kill switch maybe for your add-ons or something like that? Uh, so we have not received any uh, national security letters, uh, nor any orders to modify our code. So we can put that out there for now, and you know, ask the question again next year, see what happens. Um, but I, I think that you know th this would be something that, uh, of course, we would fight. We we believe very strongly uh, that the government should not be able to force a, a back door. That uh, one of the core issues that uh, EFF has been working on for. You know, most of its existence since the 90s is the notion that uh, code is speech, that you have uh, First Amendment rights to publish code, and that if the government is going to come along and tell us what kind of code we have to publish, that, that would violate our rights. We also think they don't have the statutory authority to, to tell us what to put in our code, but uh, even if they uh, did have a statute, that that statute would be uh, unconstitutional. Uh, and I think that the second way that, that there's some, some assurance is that uh, we put our source code out there. And I think, Jeremy, could you Yeah, I was just going to say, the, the other addition is all of our extensions, as well as Let's Encrypt, are all open, or uh, CertBot, are all open source. So you can check the source. You can compile it yourself if you don't want to, you know, trust the distribution channel. Uh, and then the other thing is also just by default, we don't really collect any data. Uh, HTTPS everywhere, if you turn off the SSL observatory, uh, doesn't send anything back to us whatsoever. Uh, Privacy Badger doesn't send anything back to us. Uh, I think maybe like crash reporting or something like that if you turn it on. Um, so we don't have much to give the feds even if they, you know, came to us, which is of course by design. Also, we're a hard target. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, 
they, they would have to have some brass uh, <laughs> to, to think that we were going to backdoor anything. Yeah. Uh, similar to what we've heard before, thank you guys so much for everything that you do. It makes us able to, as a pen tester, and I'm sure as many other people here, uh, thank you, uh, makes us able to do what we do. Um, we also, you mentioned earlier the Signal protocol, which has been incredibly successful with its integration in several different apps, including WhatsApp. Is EFF doing anything to help either from the technical side, uh, help develop it, or from the legal side, make it more available and make it easier for people in maybe other countries to access it? Crypto export plug. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, so uh, one thing we are working on, uh, some of you may be familiar, we had this secure messaging scorecard uh, up for a while. Uh, we're working on a revamp of it, and the, really the main focus of that is to encourage developers to uh, basically adopt better protocols, better tools, better designs for secure messaging. Um, and so watch, I would say watch this space. Uh, that's going to come up again soon, and we'll be rating, not so much rating, but basically, you know, listing, you know, which tools we think are secure, which ones we would say avoid at all costs. Um, and so that's part of it. I don't know if Katitsa, you want to, or? Um, just uh, one quick preview of the revamped secure uh, messaging yep. scorecard. Uh, there is no such thing as a completely secure yeah. tool. There is nothing that will be in our top tier of this thing is perfect. Uh, sort of n nothing's getting five stars. Uh, everybody has room to improve. There's lots of ways to go. And uh, we're hoping we're going to see a whole lot more uh, integration of end-to-end -end encryption in secure messaging tools in the future. Uh, to answer your question, we promote some uh, tools on our surveillance self-defense. One of those is Signal. And we do an um, IVADA as a lot of uh, security trainer uh, to potential trainers in developing countries and around the world. We just finished uh, a tour in Mexico through all the country, and so we do a lot of that. Our guy is in several languages, and we are also looking to translate it to more. Yeah. Thank you. I also want to thank you very much for all your work that you're doing, including uh, net neutrality. Uh, my question is about net neutrality. It seems uh, certain mobile carriers are getting away with uh, getting around net neutrality by zero rating certain streaming providers. <clears throat> uh, what are the, F are the uh, e EFF's thoughts on like uh, whitelisting only particular websites like, uh, uh, like streaming sites? So uh, we definitely have, uh, zero rating's complicated, right? Because on the one hand, it's very easy to say, uh, well, I mean, and there's, there's reasons to say like it can be useful in certain scenarios and make it a lot easier to access the web for people. Uh, at the same time, it's really easy to make it into a tool that distorts uh, uh, competition and really makes it hard, uh, you know, it can almost be a form of censorship in some sense. Uh, one thing uh, that we are, I mean, so we are keeping an eye on uh, uh, zero rating. Uh, if you saw our blog post uh, at the very beginning of the year that got the T-Mobile CEO uh, cursing at me via Twitter. Uh, so, and we're continuing to look at that. Um, I don't know, I mean, we don't at the, at the moment have any like big complaints or anything planned, um, but we are sort of staying on the topic, keeping an eye on things, and so we're, it's on our radar. And we're, we're following the FCC enforcement actions pretty closely. Thank you. Let's, en Let's Encrypt presents an uh, obvious threat to the incumbent industry. What do you, what does the EFF see as the future of for-profit strict authorities, and what do you think they should do to stay relevant, if anything? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, so, so, so one big thing that Let's Encrypt doesn't do is it doesn't do extended validation. It's only domain validation. Um, so it is really just, it's just authenticating that you control the domain you say you, you do. Uh, it's not saying that you are, in fact, the organization that you say you are. And so, and you know, we don't, there's no way to easily automate that. And because Let's Encrypt wants to be an automated system, uh, we don't see, I mean, we're never gonna really get into the extended validation business. And so that's an area where, uh, you know, for-profit CAs can still do things. Um, I mean, I would say just off the top of my head, that's the biggest one. Um, I mean, in some sense, you know, I mean, part of it too is just we wanted to get really hit that long, low tail 
Um, you know, I don't think you know Bank of America or whoever else is going to switch to a Let's Encrypt certificate just because they really like that extra little green bar in the in the URL bar. So, thank you. Uh, my question is regarding uh, the root cause for Canary Watch being abandoned and uh, what the best direction forward is for national security letters. Uh, well, thank you. So I, I worked on the, the Canary Watch project and I work also uh, on our national security letter uh, cases. Um, so with, with Canary Watch, uh, you know, we, we had a lot of uh, ambitions for, for the site. We wanted to have uh, something that would uh, list out what various canaries were, have uh, automated uh, uh, checking to see if there were any uh, diffs and then um, it ended up having a lot of false positives that were just because of like the URL change or the format change or something about it changed that wasn't a meaningful one. Uh, there were also a couple of instances in which people just didn't update things in a timely manner but then they, then they did and so it was a, a sort of human error false positive. Uh, so it was not really being effective at sort of the, 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 the concept. Um, I actually think that, that for uh, uh, people who want to be transparent, who want to be able to, to say that you know, they, they have not received a national security letter, um, that regularly issued transparency reports where you list everything. You put the subpoenas, the warrants, what, whatever it is you might be getting, you know, and you would say national security letter zero, FISA court order zero. Uh, and you issue those, uh, just as many companies do, you know, going all the way up to giant telecoms and internet companies regularly issue those. Uh, and then every, uh, you know, say six months, you know, you issue a new one. And in each one, you say the most that you're allowed to by law. So if it's zero, you can say zero. If you receive one, you might not be able to say anything at all. But in all cases, you just do the most that you can allowed by law. And uh, also, if you get that NSL in the meantime, uh, reach out to EFF because we want to we work on that. We are already litigating uh, on behalf of uh, uh, two companies that have received national security letters. We're challenging the constitutionality of the letters, their, their gag orders. Uh, that is going up to the uh, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, right now. And we're, we're uh, um, well, we think that they are a tremendous constitutional problem because these letters are going out without court involvement, having a gag order that only has court involvement on the back end after you complain about it uh, and it doesn't uh, comply with uh, the First Amendment. So that's what we do about NSLs. We need to get NSLs found unconstitutional and stopped. You can, s you can send your email to info at eff.org. All right, thank you. And we have two minutes, so this may be our, our uh, last question. All right. Question. I want to thank all the good work you guys do and I've donated to you in the past. Um, thank you. But I, having said that, I don't actually follow you guys that closely. But I do have a question. Uh, you guys are rooted in, you know, the Western, uh, you know, legal systems in Europe and the United States. But what about uh, areas of the world, in particular China and Russia, where the legal systems are, you know, not as uh, the same, basically? And do you have partners? What, what, what kind of work have you done in those areas? And that's pretty important because there are like 300 million people now in those areas. All right. Uh, EFF actually has an extensive international team. Uh, the internet is global and so are the problems on it. Uh, and some of what we do is, uh, is policy work. Uh, obviously we don't do uh, impact litigation outside of the United States because this would require us to have a lawyer from every country and that's more staff than we actually have at all of EFF. Uh, but what we do is um, we do trainings, uh, we provide uh, all kinds of technical advice. We have a project called Surveillance Self-Defense, which you can find at ssd.eff.org, uh, which is translated into eight languages, uh, in, including Russian, if I remember correctly, uh, that uh, gives you all kinds of technical advice on how to keep yourself safe, especially in situations where you do not trust the government. Basically, if you don't trust the government, encrypt everything. And we do policy work. Uh, yeah, and we do policy work. We, we usually, um, because we cannot have lawyers in each country, we work with lawyers in each country. 
uh, to fight draconian surveillance laws. We uh, share knowledge on the topics, but we also use international human rights law in order to defeat those bills that are in Congress because in many countries outside the United States, especially developing countries and the European Union, the European Court of Human Rights or the Inter-American Court of Human Rights uh, really uh, it have a little teeth and you can uh, sue uh, that a country is violating international human rights law. It's not as powerful as the other kind of litigation, but uh, we can do, uh, we can testify, we can use those to defeat laws. Alrighty, so I, uh, unfortunately we're out of time now, uh, but before we finish up, I just want to do a little public shaming. How many of you are EFF members who have renewed in the last year? Okay, great. So for those of you who don't know, uh, we are not as big as you might think. We're a group of, you know, 70 employees who make all the amazing things you know EFF does happen, and we are a member-supported nonprofit. So uh, please stop by one of the booths, get an awesome DEF CON t-shirt, uh, and so that we can keep doing the awesome work we're doing. Uh, in, we're in the vendors room, in the contest room. And stick around uh, because Nate is going to give an awesome talk about the state of the law with respect to crypto. So thanks everybody for coming. Thank you.